All right, welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Heather Sanderson, and I feel delighted to be invited by mankind to talk a bit about the coronavirus and the consumption of cannabis and how those things interrelate these days. So one thing I want to just start with is that there's a lot that we don't know. This is a brand new virus. Um, and so we are learning things every day, every hour. There's new information coming out, certainly from Asia and Europe, that's informing the decisions um, that the collective is making and then the recommendations that I'm making. So a lot of this um, could change. And then there will probably be some questions that I just won't know the answers to just because we don't have them. But there's also a lot of common sense that we can use here and things that we've learned from other viruses um, that can certainly be applied. So what I first want to discuss is um, some of the conversations that have been going around about you know, why are we as a society making such huge moves, right? Why are so many people losing their jobs? Why, are, why is everyone being um, told to stay home? What's the difference between coronavirus and the flu? And so I just wanna go through some of the big things about coronavirus that make it different um, before we launch into why uh, specifically maybe some of the consumption patterns are, um, in cannabis should, should shift. So um, the number one thing is that coronavirus is novel, the novel coronavirus, right? You've heard that in the news. It's brand new. So nobody's immune system has ever seen this before. That's very different from the flu where there's some version of the flu that goes around every year. It usually bounces back and forth from the northern hemisphere in the winter to the, win to the southern hemisphere during its winter. And it changes a little bit here and there. Um, but for the most part, we have some degree of immunity to that. And so it's not brand new. So not everybody gets it all at once. The other thing is that there's no known treatment. Now today there was a new study that came out and, and so I have some hope around the discovery of a treatment. And as you may have heard in the news, um, there's medications that are being repurposed that have already been FDA approved. We know about their safety. They've been used for a long time. Things like Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine is one of the ones that have been, has been popularized, certainly as azithromycin and antibiotic as well. But we don't know, we don't have any proof that that is actually safe and effective yet. It's really just anecdote. Um, so hopefully we'll get more and more information soon and there will be treatment, but at this point there isn't. The other issue with that is because hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin have been so popularized, there's basically been a run on them. So um, if you or someone you love comes down with the disease, you may not have access to that medication um, just because we don't have the ability to make it by tomorrow. So um, a little bit more on that later, but also vaccines. Currently there is no vaccine, although there is for the flu. Um, and regardless of how you feel about vaccines, you know, every medical intervention has a risk benefit analysis, but certainly um, a vaccine, if some percentage of the population is vaccinated, then they will have either no um, symptoms or certainly less severe symptoms if they can be vaccinated. And that um, is, um, probably an optimistic timeline on vaccines is 12 to, four, 12 to 18 months. So that is not right around the corner. Hopefully we'll be out of quarantine before then. Um, there also seems to be a much higher complication and mortality rate with coronavirus versus the flu. So more people are hospitalized. And it spreads very easily, much more easily than the flu. Um, and that means that you can pick this up, say, if your Amazon delivery man um, drops off a package, you could grab that package. Your, unfortunately, your Amazon delivery man might be asymptomatic. He might not have any symptoms, but he might be a carrier of the infection. He might have coughed or sneezed on that package. It can stay on that surface for days. You could pick it up, then touch your face and be infected. So also just as easily going through the grocery store, touching cart, the handle of a cart, um, picking up something that somebody else has touched or sneezed or coughed on, this can be very easily spread. So I hope that that's clear about why this is different. So why we need to take such big steps to prevent the spread of the virus. So this idea of flattening the curve, I hope this is old news and that every single person listening right now knows exactly what I'm talking about when I say flatten the curve. And if not, um, please pay attention. So this is why, even though it's inconvenient and it sucks and it's lonely to stay home and, um, 
so many people are losing jobs and you know, there's a lot of destruction happening right now. The reason is because the goal is to flatten this curve. What we want is this blue curve. We want the infection rate because this is, like I said, a novel virus. No one has ever been exposed to it. Because of that, um, right now, we could potentially all get it all at once. The idea of staying home, of social isolation or social distancing, is that we spread that number out over months and potentially years. And as we do that, the healthcare system is able to take care of everyone who needs the care. So if where we are right now is, is unfortunately right about here, where every, so many people are being infected all at the same time that we are hitting our capacity. So this means um, the number of ICU beds. This means the number of doctors available to, excuse me, available to take care of people. Um, this means the number of ventilators uh, available to help people breathe. So what we want to do is flatten that curve out. And, um, and although we, most of us will probably at some point be infected by this. Um, what we want to do is make sure that we're not all doing that at the same time. So really the goal is not to never get the, the virus, it's to not all get it at the same time. So unfortunately, um, we're winning. <laughs> Today, the United States um, passed every other nation in the world in terms of the number of cases. And um, this was, I got this shot from the New York Times earlier today. And um, since then, we have passed 100,000 confirmed cases in the US. And that is despite not much testing. So with, um, with these cases, we are expecting that, the, unfortunately, the deaths to, to rise. And um, and especially as we hit that capacity of what's available in our healthcare system to take care of the people who really need it. So what we wanna to do tonight is talk about um, some of how to take care of yourself so that you don't end up being one of those people that needs the healthcare that uh, unfortunately may not be available. So what happens with coronavirus is that um, you either breathe it in or you touch your nose or mouth. It goes into the mucosa or the, the inner lining of your nose, your sinuses, your mouth or your throat. And then that viral particle ends up in your lungs. And some of that can happen at night through aspiration. Um, and things that make you more likely to aspirate these viral particles at night um, include age. So as you age, the swallowing, um, the muscles of swallowing are less coordinated and um, these viral particles can go into your lungs more easily. Also the consumption of alcohol can do this as well, especially at night or before bed. If you relax those muscles, you're more likely to aspirate these viral particles. So the lungs, um, this is your, your windpipe or trachea. And then from there, the lungs kind of look like a tree and the functional unit of the lung is this alveoli. Um, and this is an air sac where there's the exchange of oxygen. And this is in this analogy of the lungs being like a tree, this would be the leaf. So there's lots and lots and lots of alveoli in the lungs and that's where oxygen and CO2 are exchanged. What happens over the course of coronavirus infection, um, especially if you uh, are in a have a complicated case, is that there's a thickening of this membrane between the air, the air sac, and then the blood where that oxygen needs to go. So people who have complications associated with coronavirus will end up feeling like they can't breathe and, and really they won't be able to breathe. It's almost like a drowning. And then as that happens, um, more mucus can build up here and the, this is a ripe place for secondary infection. So not only a viral infection, but potentially a bacterial in infection or pneumonia um, in the lungs. So what we wanna do is avoid that. How to keep your lungs healthy um, is a big part of what I want to talk about tonight and um, avoid the risk of developing ARDS or that acute uh, respiratory distress. Um, so signs of coronavirus, I want to talk about this because testing is not widely available. 
Um, there are currently lots of limits to the testing. And so we're kind of back with old school methods of figuring out what's going on. And that is just cataloging your symptoms. So fever, cough, and shortness of breath, the top three there are the most common symptoms. However, over the past few weeks, as we've gotten more and more data out of both Asia and Europe, um, stomach complaints like diarrhea, anorexia, or appetite loss, nausea, and vomiting are also very common and seen in about half of coronavirus patients. And what unfortunately was happening is that people didn't realize that this was a sign of coronavirus, and so they weren't getting adequate care um, soon enough, and um, they were having poorer outcomes. So certainly I want people to be aware that that can be a sign of coronavirus and, and to get help. Um, another thing is pink eye or conjunctivitis, so it can affect the mucosa of your eye, not just your, your nose and mouth and, and lungs. And then also, I want to talk about loss of smell. Um, there are many, many people who get coronavirus, who have the infection, and really have very few symptoms. And in Taiwan, as they've tested a lot of people who are, um, who are asymptomatic, one of the only symptoms they are seeing in about 30% of, of positive coronavirus patients is just the loss of smell. So this is really important to know because if you experience loss of smell and no other symptoms, you can be giving the coronavirus to other people. So this again is why we're encouraging so many people to stay home. So the current testing, um, what was available, so I'm, I'm a physician, I'm a naturopathic doctor in North County, and I ordered tests from kits from LabCorp, and they came. They take eight days to get back. So in to figure out if you have a positive or negative test, you could be infecting other people. Um, this is part of the idea of quarantining or, or of course, staying home. Um, the other issue with those tests, those are PCR testing, um, is what was going on there. And the issue with those is they have about a 30 to 40 percent false negative rate. So that means that I, as a doctor, I'd get back a test that says, yeah, test results that say you're negative when actually you did, in fact, have coronavirus. So um, that is not great accuracy. Um, and there's a lot of problems that come up from that. So you don't want to rely on testing. Just in the last few days, there are more antibody testing um, available. There is more antibody testing available. This is going to be very helpful, especially for us in the United States, because a lot of people have been exposed, have had potentially had coronavirus, but we don't have any tests that show that they have immunity to it. Right now, we're assuming that coronavirus will be like other viruses and you will be able to develop immunity, but we don't know that with absolute certainty. The data looks like that's the case, but we don't know 100%. Um, so it will be nice, though, at some point to be able to test someone's blood and say, yes, you've been exposed, you have immunity, you're not at risk of one, getting it again, or two, of spreading it. So hopefully that's right around the corner. Um, then the, I want to talk about what we can do to keep everyone in the 80% of cases that do not require hospitalization. So um, there's a couple of things here that are a little misleading. One, mild, calling this 80% mild, this encompasses everyone who does not need to go to the hospital. So this can be the person that just can't smell. This can be the person that doesn't even have that symptom, has absolutely zero symptoms. And this could also be the person who feels like they're dying but is at home with a fever and tight, uh, chest tightness and aches and pains, but it's just the worst flu that you've ever had in your life and you aren't actually about to die. Then there's these, this 20% of people, so 20 out of 100 people who get coronavirus, who, um, who could actually die and who need medical help. Um, so right now, with the way things are in the world, um, we want to make sure that you are in this 80%, that if you get it, you do not need to go to the hospital, um, because unfortunately, the hospital um, may not have the ability to take care of you in, um, soon. Um, so the other misleading thing here is that based on observations, so I'm just going to read through this so I can, can clear up this um, as we've learned more, this has changed, but based on observa observations made from the start of the epidemic in China, doctors guess that the mortality rate of the coronavirus is practically zero for patients under the age of 50. So that data is changing very, very quickly, particularly here in the U.S. Um, there, you guys may have heard that there was a teenager in Lancaster up in L.A. who passed away this week. 
Um, also in Europe, we're seeing much younger people be uh, hospitalized, and then um, that, that that mortality rate in younger people is is definitely not zero. So we're not in the clear just because we're under 60. Um, certainly less risk, but still not in the clear. So what do we do to keep us in the 80%? Let's talk about happier, more proactive things now. Um, so avoid smoking. Um, I, I totally understand the case for cannabis consumption right now. I think that that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, and I would offer that anyone who's considering that or, or consuming cannabis switch away from anything vaped or smoked. And that's because of what we described going on in the lungs. So those alveoli, we want to do everything we can to make sure that they're as healthy and able to the immune system that lines that mucosa in the lungs, that they're able to fight this virus and get rid of it. So um, there was a doctor interviewed in Leafy. Thank you, Kathy, for sending that over. Um, and she was saying that inhalation of particular, she's a pulmonologist, right? So this is coming from someone who has more expertise in this area than I do. Um, but she said, without a doubt, inhalation of particulate matter, whether it's due to cigarettes, marijuana, coal, stoves, um, wood burning stoves, or pollution has always led to diminished lung function and increased susceptibility to lung infections. Coronavirus is without a doubt a lung infection. So it's very important to avoid any vaping or smoking. Um, what a great opportunity though to learn to create the topicals um, or capsules or tinctures out of raw bud um, that you probably had bookmarked or tabbed somewhere. And now that you're stuck at home, we can all start to repurpose these things and find uh, creative new ways to consume. So other things that I would recommend avoiding, certainly people, right? This is the whole point of staying home. Avoid people, they're full of germs. Um, and then alcohol, we talked a bit about that, how alcohol can has the ability to relax those muscles in, in around um, the windpipe and make it easier for you to um, to swallow or to inhale those viral particles and have them get into your lungs. Um, and then alcohol also just is an immune depressant. So I would say if you had the choice or if you were considering consuming alcohol to take the edge off or cannabis to take the edge off, my recommendation at this point would be edible or just non-combustible. So anything you're not smoking or vaping, um, but cannabis. And then other things to avoid, of course, to help with your immune function, Staying up too late, I think there can be a temptation. I certainly was guilty of this for a few days. Um, to stay up late, reading the news, uh, reading what just came out that day, and, and not get to bed on time because maybe there isn't as much to get up for in the morning. Um, but really, maintaining your rhythm is so helpful for mental health as well as for your immune system. So getting to bed on time, waking up um, as close to going to bed as close to when the sun sets and then getting up as close to when the sun rises. Avoiding junk food and sugar, again, a great opportunity to get into the kitchen and start cooking. I've been really astounded kind of in disbelief walking into grocery stores and seeing that all the bread is gone, but the produce section is completely stocked. So get into that produce section. Um, certainly ginger, garlic, uh, all of these, there's lots of herbs, the Mediterranean herbs like rosemary and thyme. These are all very antimicrobial, so great for immune function. And I would encourage um, getting into the kitchen. It's good for your, your health, not only now, but even in post-corona times, it will be. Um, emotional isolation, of course, is an option here. We live, we are very lucky to live in a day and age where we can connect by, um, by Zoom, like we are now, by phone, by FaceTime. There's lots of options for connecting uh, virtually right now without having to be in the same room. Um, staying depressed or angry, I want to just acknowledge that this is a totally crazy, crazy time and people are losing jobs. Um, certainly as, as this crisis deepens, um, people will, will lose family members or know people who are, are very ill and that is terrifying. So I do not want to at all suggest that this is um, a time when you shouldn't feel those emotions like that is very appropriate and i think that finding someone connecting with someone who can help you validate that but who encourages you not to get stuck in that um in 
encourages you and helps you to find ways to um, look for ways to reframe the situation. Where are the opportunities? Um, what is it? What can I do to contribute? How can I help? What can I do to help with solutions? Um, who do I want to be on the other end of this crisis? Asking those sorts of questions that are much more um, positive and powerful than being stuck in anger and depression. Um, some other big questions that have been coming up lately have been around ibuprofen and blood pressure medications. So there is not a ton of clarity here. Um, in my house, we are going to avoid ibuprofen just out of prudence. Um, there have been mixed reports coming out of Europe that have suggested that ibuprofen, taking ibuprofen for the fever to reduce the fever is, um, is associated with higher incidence of, of, um, of complications and the need for hospital, hospitalization. So I am recommending that people avoid ibuprofen, use Tylenol. Now Tylenol, you don't wanna get over 3000 milligrams per day or three grams per day. So reducing, making sure you're not hitting that threshold. If you are, then I think a little bit of ibuprofen would be okay, but taking ibuprofen every eight hours over and over for days, um, has the potential to have risk associated with it. Also, I'm a naturopathic doctor, so my bias here is that ibuprofen, or excuse me, that a fever has benefits that come with it. Now, um, ibuprofen, it suppresses some of the immunoglobulin response and some of the other good responses from, um, from the, the immune system. So we might be getting rid of both the good and the bad if we take too much ibuprofen. With blood pressure medications, although I want to be clear that that's still a big question mark. I'm saying that out of prudence, not because we know for sure. Um, blood pressure medications, I think there's a little bit more clarity. There was some question around ACE inhibitors and certain blood pressure medications um, because the virus attacks at these ACE receptors. So um, right now, my recommendation to any patient who is on those blood pressure medications is not to change anything. I don't think we have enough information that suggests we need to do anything. I think the, the risk of getting off of them outweighs the benefit, the potential benefit. So um, what to do? So we've talked about what to avoid. Um, now, what are things that we can do to help to um, improve our immune function? Certainly getting plenty of exercise. You know, we all are in this, this shift of what our, our, our typical patterns used to be. Maybe we're not commuting anymore. We're certainly not going to the grocery store anymore. So harnessing that, that time, that extra time that we have, even though we can't get to the gym, what can you do? Can you go for a walk in your neighborhood? Can you go for a run? Can you get on a rebounder? Jumping rope doesn't take up much time or space. Um, there's lots of ways that we can get creative. Uh, there's a ton of people offering yoga, um, lots of it free online yoga, meditation, other things um, to, to engage in um, while we're stuck at home. And then again, sleep, making sure that we get enough sleep that's if, uh, integral and essential to good immune function and getting that sleep as much at night and before midnight. Um, so getting to sleep at a, at a regular time. And then nutrition and digestion, what a fantastic opportunity, a fantastic invitation this is to spend more time in the kitchen cooking for yourself and learning to cook. Um, Again, stress management and cannabis being potentially a part of that. Um, meditation, this, there are lots and lots of resources out there. I'm a fan of Brene Brown. She's got some COVID-19 um, specific resources available. Also Deepak Chopra and um, Oprah have created another um, meditation series that's free and available right now. So there's lots of those available. Um, and I would encourage you to, to engage in them and then Hopefully that'll also be something you can continue into a post-COVID era. Keeping, maintaining connection. Um, last night, a friend of mine had a birthday. She was supposed to have a birthday party and instead she hosted a Zoom party. It was actually a ton of fun. I wasn't expecting to want to stay on it other than just to check in and say hi to everyone. And, and I was on for like an hour and a half. It was a lot of fun. So I'd highly encourage that even if you're skeptical. Um, back to the basics, just keeping surfaces clean and disinfected washing your hands, washing your hands, washing your hands. So the virus, um, the virus, oh, um, I'm gonna skip ahead for a minute here just to hygiene. So the virus, it has a fat, um, a fatty layer around the outside of the virus and that fatty layer 
When it can be dissolved, um, it, that basically neutralizes the virus. So it can no longer hijack your cells and replicate in your body. So um, the way to do this is with soap, alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, or bleach. There are a lot of things that actually do not work. So I want to I want to get rid of the the thought that like any alcohol under 65%. So like if you have vodka in the cabinet, that is not going to work. Vinegar, lemon, baking soda. You know I love these things all day. Usually I'm not a germaphobe, but right now we're just we're going straight to the 99% um, isopropyl alcohol lots and lots of soap. If it's antibacterial soap, you don't need the, an the antibacterial part is not going to do anything. This again is a virus, but, um, but having plenty of soap, um, the soap itself will do it. And then making sure that it foams. That's part of why we want you to wash your hands for us medical professionals, want you to wash your hands for 20 seconds, a full 20 seconds. So say in the ABCs, um, there's a, some other tricks for how long you want to be doing this for, but that thorough hand washing is really important to get all of those viral particles to, to dissolve and, and neutralize. Um, of course, masks and then not touching your face. I've probably touched my face 15 times since seven o'clock, so believe me, it's not easy, but um, very important. Um, going back to alleviating anxiety and depression in this crazy, crazy time, Cannabis, I, I think, has a lot to offer here. Also, um, in, this, in these weeks where we cannot get to see an acupuncturist or a chiropractor or for injections or whatever it was that you were doing for pain relief or help with tension, um, I think cannabis is a, a great alternative. Um, so, and, and also, you know, I, I'd imagine that people have PTSD coming up at this point. Um, I think, and this, I'm, I'm speaking to a group of people who I, I imagine all know that this list and many more things that should be added to it. But um, cannabis really has very minimal risks, particularly if you're not inhaling it right now. So I would encourage the use of cannabis um, where it, it provides benefit. And then immune support supplements. So this is a pretty quick and dirty list of what I have been supporting my patients in implementing. And certainly if someone has specific questions, I'm, I'm happy to do a consult. But zinc, zinc is part of how um, having plenty of zinc will help to prevent the virus from getting into your cells. Vitamin D um, is helpful for mood through this crazy time, as well as your immune function, very essential to immune function. Vitamin A, especially essential to the mucosal immune function. So a good thing to have on enough of that on hand. Um, and then vitamin C as well, of course. Quercetin is another one that seems to be specific for this. Helps uh, both, both vitamin C, quercetin, and then um, another favorite of mine is glutathione. It helps not by taking antioxidants like vitamin C, quercetin, and potentially glutathione or vitamin E could be helpful. And then colostrum is another one of my favorites um, that certainly helps with immune function by giving you immunoglobulins. And the ones I use tend to be bovine or egg derived. So uh, those should be pretty readily, all of these should be pretty readily available um, at health food stores, hopefully uh, right now. And if you have specific questions, I'm happy to answer them. And then just staying sane. We've talked a little bit about this, but certainly some strategies that I am using personally and um, that I think make a lot of sense are start with, with gratitude. Um, this was a great time as I have had more time at home. Um, I started actually writing the thank you notes that have been on my list for a long time. And it's been a, a nice exercise and seeing how much there is to be grateful for. So looking for things um, that you do have, maybe it's it's your cat or a, a warm bed to crawl into, just the really simple things when we don't have access to our normal daily lives. And then looking around for ways to help others, there is a ton of positive psychology research on this, looking around um, for ways to help, it, uh, it definitely takes the, the focus off of you um, and then gives you that feedback that you're doing something good. Um, and then we talked about about staying on a routine, I think that's very, very important. It can take some willpower and some self-control, but it's certainly a very, very important part of, of this crazy and unprecedented time. Then again, finding ways to connect, whether it's writing a letter and mailing it by snail mail, 
giving someone a call, sending an email, whatever that means for you, finding ways to connect with other people, and then also staying connected spiritually, um, whatever that means for you, whether it's meditation or prayer or um, getting in touch with, with your community. And then moving your body, very, very important. Getting your circulation going um, is it's so important for staying sane and for staying healthy. Movement is part of how we move our immune cells through our body, through our lymphatic system. So um, getting, getting fresh blood flow and, and moving your body is helpful. And exercise, hands down, best deal in medicine. Do it every day. And then another thing I want to bring up is just permission to say yes to help. So today there was a bill signed into law federally that in, you know, increased, hopefully if you haven't heard of this, I would encourage you to go look. It increased loans for small businesses. It increased unemployment benefits. I think there's lots of people, um, low wage workers who are actually going to end up making more staying home than they would have if they had, had um, stayed in low, low wage jobs. So look into those things, take advantage of them, um, go through the steps to get that, that money coming your way. Or if someone reaches out and says, hey, can I go to the grocery store for you? If you need it, say yes. Give yourself permission to say yes to help when someone offers. You're going to be doing them the favor, right? Because that helps with um, helping helps others, right? A lot, giving them the, the opportunity to help helps them. And then stay hopeful. I certainly have a lot of hope after today. You know, the, the stimulus bill was signed. Um, we had another 80 person um, study come out of France showing that the hydroxychloroquine uh, and azithromycin may be very helpful. Um, the testing seems to seem to advance today. I saw new news about new tests being available, the immunoglobulin testing in particular. So the, we are not at the end of this tunnel by any stretch, but there is a lot to be hopeful about. Um, and I, I really felt today, um, more than uh, previous days this week and last, um, it felt like there, there was uh, good news coming down the pipe. And then um, certainly in this time, identifying the opportunities, right? And I don't mean financially, although maybe somebody will come up with that, I'm sure. But um, just identifying the opportunity to, to take the time and really um, for self, whether it's, it's personal growth, um, or, or identifying opportunities to spend more time with your family if you're quarantined with them, whatever the opportunity for, for you is, um, identifying it and then seizing it in this moment. We will not be quarantined forever. So what are the things that you can do in this very precious time that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise? Um, here are some resources. And then what I'd like to do is open things up to... Um, two questions. So let me see if I can find the chat box here. Give me one moment. There we go. Okay, I'm in the chat. Um, okay, great. The, so thank you. It looks like Michael sent a question and feel free to send questions. Um, so how do you prepare fresh vegetables for juicing or should they be cooked instead of juicing? So Michael, I think the question is around how likely am I to get the virus from potentially um, vegetables that I pick up in the store? So if somebody else has been touching them, what do I need to do to wash them or cook them so that I'm not gonna get, um, so that I am not going to, okay, stop, okay, thank you. Um, so that I am not going to be getting being exposed to the virus. So um, what we're doing at this point is washing everything with, we're spraying things down with isopropyl alcohol, and that includes vegetables. Um, I am still juicing, but I'm thoroughly washing, and I'm using a veggie rinse um, that does have some soap in it, and then I'm just rinsing it really well so I'm not tasting soap in my juice. Um, so I am still juicing, uh, and... I, I do think that there is some risk of picking things up from the grocery store and what other grocers are handling, um, as well as, as packages left outside. So even if you are isolated in your home, anything that's coming in has the potential to be contaminated. So we're leaving mail outside for three days and then bringing it in. Um, and then uh, also we are at my house where we're spraying as much as we can with isopropyl alcohol and then rinsing again in the sink. So I hope that and answers your question. Um, in my personal opinion, how long will quarantine last? 
you know, I think that this is anyone's guess. Um, and I suspect that this is, a, a, this is Gavin Newsom in, in California, this will be Gavin Newsom's decision. Um, as a healthcare provider, my preference for the health and safety of people is that it lasts longer, that it's not over by Easter. Um, I, don't, I think that that's very um, irresponsible. Um, what I do, I, I'm also very aware of, you know, the effects on health of being isolated, of being quarantined, particularly for people who uh, either have, don't have enough food or are in um, inhospitable uh, environments, maybe in abusive relationships or anything like that. There's, there's certainly a price to this. So um, I, I don't know how long I think quarantine will last. Um, I suspect six to eight more weeks but I'm, I'm not positive on that. The faster we can get testing and the faster that we can get treatment, the sooner it will be over. And if we can get those things um, quicker, then, then certainly that'll um, go away. So um, I'm just wearing so many, uh, sorry, I'm reading and talking at the same time. Give me a second here, let me catch up. So can my service dog carry the virus on his fur? And if so, do you know any ways to sanitize him that aren't bathing him every time we have to go out? Uh, great question. So um, you could spray him down with isopropyl alcohol. So it, it's a bit drying, I mean, to our skin as well as to theirs. But even if you just got it on his fur, or if you saw that he was in touch with, um, probably in the store, after the grocery store, something like the grocery store. Now, if you're going for a walk around your house and outside, that's probably not a huge deal unless he's sniffing other people, um, he or she, sorry, I don't know, his. Um, then soap is going to be very helpful. So after going to the store, you may want to wash him, and hopefully you're only going to the store maybe once a week, every couple weeks. Um, and I would say in between spraying with a little bit of isopropyl alcohol is going to be the best way to do that. Um, do you think the selected medications will work? Oh, I hope so. Um, I, I am very hopeful about the hydroxychloroquine azithromycin combination. I think the biggest question for me right now with that is when the cardiac risk, so the combination of those two medications does have some cardiac risk associated with it, at the uh, doses that they're looking at, that they've been using in, in China and in France, that's relatively low risk, but it's still present, especially for somebody who maybe has underlying cardiac um, com comorbidities or other cardiac issues going on. Um, the other issue there is that the virus can, does not only attack the lungs, so it can attack um, the heart. And if you are adding two medications that potentially have cardiac risks associated with them, and then in addition, it's a, you have a strain of the virus or the virus in you is attacking your heart, I think that there, there is a considerable amount of risk there. Um, and then the other issue with those medications, um, the hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin combination is that because they were popularized, there's basically been, a, there's a shortage of them. There's a huge shortage of them. Um, I don't believe that you can actually get them right now. Um, I hear different reports from different people uh, all the, every day, but my understanding is that right now you cannot get hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin. Um, and then the viral, so there was a follow-up question to that about why didn't they choose the viral medications that we already have? So they actually did. So there are a lot of antivirals that have been studied and um, there, there are combinations of them and the antivirals just are not working from what we've seen. So the most promising thing right now that they've been able to repurpose is that hydroxychloroquine and um, azithromycin combination. So um, what else? In a shot. If a chef is not wearing a mask while cooking, how easily can it transmit into my food? Ah, I would say relatively easily. So thanks, Armando. Um, he sent that question. If a chef at a restaurant, I think you mean? like, So I have a lot of skepticism around eating out right now. Ah. I love our small businesses. I own two of them. You know, like I want to support them. And I'm also aware that there is a there are not enough masks, there is not enough hand sanitizer. And so there are restaurants that maybe 
have said they are taking extra precautions and they just don't have access to the resources that are necessary to take those precautions. So um, what we end up seeing is, is that I, I do think that it's, there's a possibility you could be being infected from food that is made outside of your home. Um, and of course, if that's raw food, if it's not cooked, that's a bigger deal. Heat is another thing that can, that can destroy this virus, right? So if things get hot enough, um, then, then that virus will um, dissolve and it won't be an issue. Um, all right, what else? Oh, hi, Crystal. Um, what do you think about the viral antibody testing Vibrant is releasing soon for practitioners? So I was in touch with Patrick this week. He's the rep up here, and um, they have, they, they, it sounds like there's another three weeks. They're still doing testing. They're still getting their FDA approval. So um, I, I'm not exactly sure the terminology on all of that, but I think they're not exactly sure about sensitivity and specificity. I have a little bit of skepticism around Vibrant's um, past track record with some of their testing, but I'm very hopeful that they do a good job and knock, out of, knock, knock it out of the park and that this becomes much more widely available and that their assays are, are good, high quality ones with high sensitivity and specificity. But I don't, um, I, I, I think it all uh, still is to be determined. Um, so with Dave, from David, um, would smoking about 80 to 90% less while switching to a tincture defeat the purpose? So no, I don't think so. I think that smoking less uh, is still helpful. Um, my recommendation, of course, is to completely stop smoking, but I do believe that smoking less is going to put less strain on your lungs, and that's the goal, is just for your lungs to be healthier. Um, switching to tincture, edibles, um, anything other than, um, than smoking or vaping, I think is, is preferable. Um, is it safer, Caitlin, from Caitlin, is it safer to use a vaporizer for marijuana flower that does not use combustion than smoking flower? Uh, my, my opinion um, is that anything that is going to be inhaled through your lungs is going to put some strain or some pressure on your lungs, and I would recommend avoiding it right now. Um, if we have cannabis flower, is putting some in a capsule to consume going to work? So I, I don't think that you can just, no. Um, ca cannabis flower into a capsule is not um, probably going to work the same, it certainly as smoking it. It, it does, to get the oils um, out of that, you're going to want to get it into a um, some sort of oil mixture. Um, so the tincture, you, you have to draw the oils out. So that can either be done using alcohol, it can be done using oil like olive oil or um, any of the others for the topicals like jojoba and stuff. I think that with, um, with, uh, with those recipes, I'm not an expert on, on how to make um, cannabis for other forms of consumption, but there are so many blogs out there and there are so many people who are really good at that. And there's lots and lots of recipes for getting, uh, getting flour into another um, form that you can consume that will get you the benefits that you're looking for. Um, I hope that it's not the same, just putting it into a capsule and eating it. Now, th I think a lot of the anti-cancer properties, you have to consume quite a bit of flour. And I think for a lot of people, it gets very expensive, but they're phenomenal anti-cancer properties from just juicing or eating um, raw bud. Okay, so my, oh, um, let me see, sorry, I'm just catching up. What is my recommendation? And to alleviate the pain if someone has the virus. So, I mean, cannabis could be part of that. Um, high dose curcumin, um, fish oils, other things that reduce inflammation. Um, and then Tylenol, I usually would never recommend Tylenol. It reduces uh, glutathione. And so it, it, it makes detox and it puts stress on your liver, of course. And that's why I would say a maximum of three grams or 3000 milligrams of Tylenol daily. That is a fever reducer. Um, but in this, in this circumstance, I would recommend, I am recommending that people avoid ibuprofen. So Tylenol becomes your other op option there. Um, 
using medicinal herbs such as echinacea, golden seal, St. John's wort, um, natural antivirals. So we just don't know. We just don't have the data at this point. I'm, I love herbs. What I typically recommend in the list of, of um, supplements that I gave you was really for immune support ahead of time. So if you're not currently infected, then that's the list of, of vitamins and supplements that I use. If you are infected, if you do have a virus, whether it's COVID-19 or the flu or anything else, then I have another list of a very active antimicrobial herbs. I love golden seal, echinacea. These are fantastic. St. John's, yes, all, all of the above. Um, larch, I mean, this, this list goes on and on and on. Um, but all of the antimicrobial herbs I think are fantastic. I tend to use things that are already put together. So um, my favorites are like biocidin is one that I use a lot. Um, from biobotanicals, and then also things like silver. Silver is a great one. This is once you already have an infection, right? So you don't want to be using these all the time. They are antimicrobials, so you want them there to work for you when you need them, not to be using them all the time. Okay. So... Okay. Um, oh, it's 12 weeks old. I have a 15-month-old at home. What we can say about the babies is they really, across the board, across the world, little kids are, they are being spared. Thank God. Um, we don't have to worry about them as much. They are little fomites, though. They are the ones that spread it. So we have to keep them isolated. Um, and that's why they're not in school. Um, yeah, cooking with oil. Yes. So from Amy... Um, instead of putting things into, in, instead of putting raw herb into capsules, you would want to cook with it. And like butter, there's a great recipes for butter. Be careful, of course, um, you know, as much as possible. I would, I would recommend probably purchasing your edibles, at least in the beginning, because, um, you know, just the classic eating too much and getting into that crazy. I think everyone's been there at one point. Um, Cannabis flower has to be decarboxylated to have therapeutic benefit. Consuming raw will not work. Oh, thanks, V. Um, okay, I, and maybe I just have a different understanding from, um, from, maybe I have old literature, but that was from five years ago or so. I was looking into that uh, cannabis for cancer and seeing that the raw flower was beneficial, um, but that may have changed. Do I recommend omega-3 for healthy folks or just people with suppressed immune system? How much do I recommend daily of EPA and DHA? Um, so with omega-3s, yeah, I tend to. There are some people who have uh, fat metabolism disorders, different certain genetics where omega-3s maybe don't always make a ton of sense. But for the general population, unless you're consuming a ton of salmon, wild, uh, uh, wild Alaskan salmon, um, and lots of good omega-3s dietarily, then typically adding, um, it depending on what you want to get out of it. So there's certainly mood benefits, there's skin benefits, there's heart benefits from EPA, DHA. So your ratios are going to depend of the EPA, DHA are going to depend on your goals. And then I, I actually, in my, uh, in my clinic, I test um, and I see where people are and then I determine doses based on that. But certainly for heart benefits, you're going to look at three grams, 3,000 milligrams to three to five grams is what you need for therapeutic benefit. Um, oh yeah, biocidin. It's great. Biocidin is great for a lot of things. So what I love about biocidin is that um, biocidin is this, I think of it like this magical Chinese formula because it has, it's very broad spectrum. So it helps with viruses, with parasites, with um, bacteria, uh, lots and lots of things. Certainly SIBO, H. pylori, lots of the classic infections that people get. And then it also um, helps support good flora. So another thing that you could throw in for great general immune support would be a probiotic and certainly for the gut mucosa. So a good high quality probiotic, um, depending on what you're trying to get out of it, I tend to um, have people do like about a hundred billion. So there's a lot of ones available at the grocery store that are going to be like 2 billion or 50 billion or a hundred million. And it's like, wow, that's a big number, but no, a hundred billion is typically what I'm aiming for. And I recommend that people rotate high quality brands. The one that you can find at Jimbo's or um, Whole Foods 
or, you know, in most grocery stores is uh, Garden of Life. I think they do a fantastic job. I see great clinical benefits with the Garden of Life brand. And then um, what we carry in my office is Orthomolecular and Zymogen, um, Bravo, Progert. Those are really good high quality ones um, that are also available. Um, Andy, will you tell me what list, is it the one from the PowerPoint? Maybe just write and let me know which list you're looking for. And then is algae as good as fish oil? All right, so with algae, um, so um, plant-based fish oil, or plant-based omegas require your body to um, take some biochemical steps and not everyone's body does that very efficiently. So if your, if your biochemistry is capable of turning the plant-based omegas um, into the omega-3s that we're looking for, that DHA and EPA, then you can get away with doing plant-based oils. Um, if your body does not do that very efficiently, then you may end up being um, in a deficit. So, I, again, I test and I look to see where people are. You may also notice, so some of the quick, easy, dirty things to look for is if your earwax is darker, that can be a sign that you need more omegas. Another thing is like cracking of the skin, um, particularly around your heels or the palm, um, the heel of your hand. If you're having any skin cracking, that can be a sign that you need more fish oils. Um, so they're also, they're very, um, very, very low risk. So I would, I would recommend, I'm, I'm pretty liberal with them. Um, how do I feel about CBD? Love CBD. Um, CBD, my understanding around CBD is that it's particularly good at modulating and potentiating other things that you put with it. And what I've seen clinically is that CBD can be helpful to take the edge off. It certainly helps with insomnia, um, can help to some degree with anxiety, especially in my more sensitive patients. But I have a lot of patients who are just like, CBD does nothing for me. But if I put CBD with curcumin, all of a sudden their uh, inflammatory markers come down. If you put CBD with THC, all of a sudden more things happen. So whenever I put um, CBD with other things, and, and this makes a lot of sense um, because CBD is a, a cell receptor modulator. So on the outside of the cell, it helps things to get in or stay out. It, it basically um, it changes the behavior of the cell, of, of the cell um, so that it's more open to these other um, interventions that we might be using. So I tend to use CBD mostly in combination with other things. Um, Sabella, do you mean by, what do you mean by full spectrum? Does that mean like, oh, whole plant? So like with, so CBD, THC, I tend to, I, I, you know, I'm, again, I'm a naturopathic doctor. So like my bias is that you use whole plants. I think that there's a lot of synergy in, in what's in those plants and in all of the, um, everything that it's made up of and all of the constituents and that there is a, uh, um, it certainly benefits and uh, some wisdom in that that I have a reverence for. And so I think whenever we're trying to isolate just the pieces that we think are important, um, we end up losing some of the magic. So yes, I do recommend whole plant. Now, of course, there's a lot of different ratios, right? So you can get something that's a 16 to one ratio CV, and then you can get things that are one-to-one -one ratio, and then, of course, high THC ratio. So playing with those ratios, depending on what your goals are, is, um, is certainly something that I would encourage. Um, melatonin for insomnia. So I, I am a melatonin fan. Um, what I would say is if you can get away with, because melatonin is a hormone, it's a hormone that's made by your pituitary, so it's made in your brain. And what we want avoid with any supplement whenever we're supplementing a hormone um, is we don't down your body's ability to make it so if we use super physiologic is the fancy kind of um, doctor term that we say but it's whenever you're using a whole lot of something that's way more than your body would ever make so if you take melatonin at five milligrams your brain 
is never makes about 300 micrograms. So um, just a small fraction of that. It's, it's one third of a, of a milligram, right? So what I typically recommend is starting with lower doses or trying to see if you can use lower doses um, for insomnia. Um, the, the other thing that happens is what I've seen clinically is that people who take, um, who take melatonin night after night, it sort of disrupts their sleep the following night. Um, so if you can wean yourself down to 300 micrograms or so, and then again, like I, I actually think cannabis is a great option for, um, and edibles, you know, small, low doses of edibles before bed. It's very helpful. Um, so I'm going to let John talk to everyone about accessing the recording. Um, and then any other questions? I think that I kept up with them, but I may have missed some. So I'm going to go back through. Um, and see if there's any others. Is it safer to use a vaporizer for marijuana flower that does not use combustion rather than smoking? Um, I think I answered this, but I want to be really clear if I didn't, um, that no, I don't think a vaporizer is a good idea. Not right now. Will the webinar be available to share? So John, I'm gonna have John answer questions about sharing the webinar. I believe that it will be available. Um, the vitamins and supplements, yes. Um, I'm happy to make that available. Um, yeah, I, I um, can understand. I think a lot of parents are concerned about getting the virus. So this is from a 62 year old um, who has young kids and, and he's widowed. So his wife isn't around. Of course that, that oh gosh. Oh, um, you want to make sure that you are here for those kiddos. Um, and yes, I think getting you on some good supplements to support that immune function um, is a prudent idea. Um, oh, wonderful. Thank you, um, John, for letting everyone know that they will be recording and emailing a leak to everyone in the next few days. Any other questions out there? Uh, can I talk about the role of the endocannabinoid system in fighting this virus? Um, you know, I, I am, I think this virus is so new, this particular virus is so new that I do not have a lot of insight into that at this point. Um, I certainly hope that we learn more. And um, I think there, there is evidence that cannabis um, cannabinoids are helpful for the immune system. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to get more information about that um, in the coming months. Yes, thank you, Kathy. I will add um, all of the suggestions for supplements to the list and uh, to the email that goes out. No problem. Right. Any, any other burning questions? It looks like I had people raise their hands. Is that something that I should address? Um, my practice is called North County Natural Medicine and it is in um, Lucadia. Um, and I think that perhaps John and the team at Mankind can put a link to, to my, the web address. It's northcountynaturalmedicine.com. Oh, thanks you guys. It was really fun to be here. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, John. There it is. All right. Signing off. Stay healthy. Stay well. Let me know if I can be of service. Thank you all for coming tonight.